So acquisitions, what are the things that they would acquire? So ultimately when we're looking at it from a purchases perspective, it could be any kind of expenditure, but our focus will be on if they are buying inventory as whole or if they're in a production manufacturing business the fact that they would be purchasing their raw materials. So we would have a debit of raw materials and again if it's local there will then be that and a credit of your trade payables or creditors. And again once we have now worked through our credit terms payment would have to be made so there would be the debits of the trade payables and then the credits of bank. So what documents in the cycle help us to initially record that? Those raw materials that have been received would be your goods received note, which would have been signed indicating that all the goods that they have accepted have now been noted on a source document and to record that amount the supplier's invoice is going to help you with that. So again you would have in terms of your journal a date, your description and then the amount. And then in terms of the payment once again, we would potentially be issued with a receipt to show that that payment was made and then the bank statement would be second type of proof to show the outflow of cash. So if we're looking at then the IAS2 requirements, now I've specifically focused here in terms of acquisitions as being your raw materials or if you purchased a finished good and then sell that finished good, it would be IAS2. But again, it could have been anything else. This could be repairs and maintenance um, or consumables, in which case you would be applying the applicable standard for that. So what IAS2 says is you need to record it initially at cost, but you need to include import duties and the cost to bring it to the location. So remember now, if we're talking about foreign, so now it's importing, you're not going to have that, but then you will have to add import duties and so on. And there will now also be a translation that needs to be calculated to determine the actual cost. You would then exclude that if it were a local purchase, and that's why we can see it over here not included in the raw materials. So remember when you want to go and test the initial transaction in terms of the cost, in terms of what's sitting on the invoice, you're going to have to do additional work to make sure all these other costs that can be included have actually also been included because IFRA specifically tells you. They also tell you costs that can't be included so you'll have to make sure that all those costs that can't be included like that like storage, are not included in that initial recording price. So guys, this is the initial recording of both the raw material transaction and that trade payable transaction. So what are the risks? Again, I'm going to look at the transaction first. And you can see, because we've got to record it according to our date, description and amount, we've got the risk that it's recorded in the incorrect date. or in the incorrect account. So that has been included in the raw materials where it shouldn't. Or at the incorrect amount. Once again, the documents to prove when it should be, the goods received note, maybe they haven't actually received the goods, but they've recorded it, so shouldn't have been recorded. So when I'm looking at the journal itself, these are the risks. 
This is the risk of the journal being mistaken. But also, there's a risk that potentially there was a raw material that was received and there was a good received note for it, but no journal was created and therefore there's the risk that they don't record something that they should. And just to distinguish what we're dealing with here, we need to say there's no journal. So this would be a case where they haven't recorded anything. So that's for the initial transaction, and this again is the same risks for the trade payable in terms of its initial recording. With regards to our subsequent from initial recording, there could be the risk that it's a foreign creditor, no payment is made at year end, so the second journal doesn't take place, and therefore the foreign creditor is not remeasured at year end to the closing rates, you're recording that account balance at the incorrect amount. So incorrect amount, and I've specifically focused here on foreign creditor at year end. because we've been speaking here about potential foreign purchases and the costs that need to be included. So if it were a foreign purchase, then there would be a foreign creditor. And at year end, if there's been no subsequent payments of that foreign creditor, then the balance needs to be remeasured because you're dealing with a financial instrument, a monetary item. These are the things you've got to be thinking about, guys. Also in terms of the subsequent is potentially if there is interest and therefore it's not recorded. But this would only be a case if they have got a contract requiring them for interest. But your trade payables should be short term in which case there shouldn't be an interest component. Okay, and then ultimately potentially payment is made and they don't record that payment, and then that doesn't exist. The trade payable doesn't exist because payment was actually made, and therefore that balance should have been removed. And once again, if that initial recording isn't done, then ultimately there could be a risk that the, the trade payable that should actually be recorded hasn't been recorded and that's included now as part of the risk with its balance at year end. So looking at your trade payables guys, initial recognition at transaction price or at the cost, including those additional amounts that get to be included. Subsequent measurement here is only for if there is potentially interest and ultimately if there has been payment made to that trade creditor, the fact that that needs to be removed from the balance. Also here, yeah, if it's a foreign, has to be remeasured at your end to the closing rate. That would be subsequent measurement. And guys, just remember, we said when we did the valuation, you could do a recon. When you're doing trade payables, you can do that additional reconciliation, selecting a sample of trade payables and going and doing a recon of what's in the sub-ledger to the creditor statements. So you can actually do a sample of items, first check them, and then you can do a total in the sub-ledger to the GL. Okay, so a nice additional procedure because there are multiple items making up that balance and there's another source document we can use. Disclosure. There is no accounting policy on how to account for your trade creditors. It's a liability, so there isn't an allowance that needs to be recorded. That's only for assets. So the disclosure, they will have to disclose just their trade payables and potentially their terms on those trade payables. Okay, 
something you would l literally in a substantive procedure just state inspect that they have disclosed according to what IFRA says. You wouldn't go into too much detail, yeah. Okay, let's have a look at payroll. 